Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to the Doing What Matters podcast. I am so excited to be back with you and have a very special guest on this week. And you are going to love this guest. This is a little bit longer of an episode, so you may have to listen in two parts. But I have my good friend Vincent Puglisi with me today on the podcast. And we are actually going to talk about two different things. I thought about dividing this up into two episodes, but I just want you to hear the excitement and the fun that Vincent and I have when we get together. So we're going to dive into entrepreneurial mindset and just that mindset that a good entrepreneur has to have and keep as they're in. Uh, the place of building that business. And then we're also going to talk about Vincent's new favorite topic, which is memberships. And you want to listen to this episode because you don't want to miss the invitation to attend a live event with Vincent and myself. I'm going to be there as well in 2025. So yeah, we're thinking a ways ahead but you want the special invitation that we have for you to be at that event with us in Florida. Can't miss it. Can't beat the location. It will be amazing. So dive into this episode. Have a great time. And yeah, just so many great takeaways that you're going to hear as I have a great conversation with my good friend, Vincent Puglisi. Hey, Vincent, it is so great to finally get you on the podcast. We have known each other for years and we finally get to record something. So welcome to the Doing What Matters podcast. Super excited, honored, thrilled. I'm just, I'm ready to go. I'm yeah, ready to go. I know you are. So here's the problem as you're listening in. Vincent and I can get off on tangents when we get together. We actually just had to talk before we started recording of what do we want to say? What's the purpose of this podcast? Because Vincent is a guy with many talents and also just so many great ideas. But I think where we want to take the episode today is I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about entrepreneurial mindset first. And I'm saying this to myself to keep us on track, because if not, we'll go down so many rabbit trails. So entrepreneurial mindset. And then I want to talk about this pivot that you just made recently mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur into the world of memberships, mm -hmm. because so many that are listening in right now really get this idea that this, it's not passive income. I never want to say that because it's not, but a membership can be that income that you have as a part of how you've niched down and what you do. So we'll get there, but I yep. think it's important first. When I say entrepreneurial mindset, like where do you go? What comes up for you? It's something we just discussed and it's, it's such a fresh conversation for me, but I was just interviewed about a book and she wanted, there was a story of connection. This guy, Fred Klein, who helped me out when I was in my mid twenties. He had no reason to help me. He was very successful. He went out of his way and changed my life. And, and, and it's a tangent, but I was working in the store and I didn't know where I was going. And I said to him, I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm a failure. I said, I'm a loser. And he looked at me, he goes, you're not a loser. He goes, you're doing what you need to do. But then he walked out and as he was opening the door, he goes, but if you're still working here in five years, you're a loser. And I was like, whoa. And so I quit the job. Two weeks later, I'm like, he is not going to come back and find me working here. And this is when I was going into the world of It was like he threw down the challenge. Yeah. And I'm like, so I had this, oh, if he comes back, I'm like, I am a loser. So I literally created my photography career from that moment on. 22 years, sports photographer, traveling the world, traveling the country, like major events because he did that. Never got a chance to thank him on my own part. When I went to write my second book, The Wealth of Connection, I'm like, I got to tell his story. So I, got, I found him out of the blue. I found his son who I went to high school with. And I said, your dad helped me. And he goes, so I connected with him and, and an amazing story. Well, he told this story to this woman that's writing a book about mentorship. And she asked me my history. So this is what, the point. I told her about all my past and how, how I struggled in high school. And I, I, it was always a challenge for me. And I questioned everything. She goes, so, so you were an entrepreneur from the beginning. And I said, no, I was not. I was like, I had all these jobs and I was always frustrated. She goes, no, but you always thought like an entrepreneur. You always questioned everything. You always were looking for something different that would be better. You didn't follow along. And she goes, that's the entrepreneurial mindset. And I said, 
She's absolutely right. The best entrepreneurs I know, they are not cookie cutter. Let me follow step by step. Give me your proven plan and let me do everything that way. They're always curious. They're always innovative. They're looking for new ideas. They're not afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. They realize with every one of those things just comes another lesson that makes them better. And you don't get those lessons by following a road, by not a roadmap, by following like a manual. So I realized all of the lessons, all the stories came from my own pain, but it made me that way. But I think that's exactly what she was talking about. The I think the entrepreneurs, they have that curiosity. They have that, I want to change something. I want to make something better as opposed to, I just want to follow directions. I think too, when you said a couple things there, but curious is one of them. And then when you said, I want to change things, sometimes I think an entrepreneur is willing to take the risk of, I don't even know for sure what I want to change, but I'm not satisfied with this or with that. And I'm going to think a little bit outside the box. I'm willing to take the risk, all of those things. There's a classic book. I don't know if you've read it, Vincent E-Myth. I don't know if you've read E-Myth. Yeah. Gerber. You know, Gerber. And he talks about the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. Mm -hmm. And I actually teach this book in a class that I do, but there is a different mindset that an entrepreneur has than a manager or a technician. None are wrong. Mm -hmm. They're all just different. Yeah. And they all fit in the world. We need all three people. And sometimes you have to be all three, even as an entrepreneur, but there is a mindset. So give us a little bit of backstory. Y'all can pick up Vincent's books. He's got two of them out on the market. You can hear all the story and read all the things and Wealth of Connection, just a great book of how Vincent has really just used his gift of being a connector and all of those things. But Tell us, you mentioned, I was a photographer. Yeah. Talk about being stuck in that mindset and kind of what pivoted for you other than somebody saying, quit this job. And yeah, I don't, it's not for, it's not everybody, but there is a common timeline that goes on with people. You go to school, you get a job. And I did, even though I knew I was not employable. So I'll give you the example. When I finally got my Me first neither. staff. Okay. <laughs> and I got my first staff job, which was the dream. You know, I went back, I went to school for photography. I was a freelancer in New York for a few years. Finally landed that staff job, my wife, and I'll never forget, this is the job. I'm getting paid full time to do what I want. I remember driving to lunch with two other staff members, being in the back seat of the car and literally feeling like I was in a prison car, like a police car. <laughs> and here's why. They own me. I remember yeah. we have to be back at 2.30. I have a schedule every day. And I was so miserable doing it, even though I was doing the work that I loved. So yep. what do you do? I don't have any business experience. And I wasn't, but, and I knew my salary is like, it's not going up outside of a big raise. So the transition was, I won sports photographer of the year. I was the top in the world out of little Evansville, Indiana, number one over the LA times in Sydney, Australia. And I was making $32,000 a year. Making 30, and, and I go into my boss's office and I, our first son's about to be born. And this is going to be the big raise. Like, I'm going to get a 10%. I'm going to make almost $40,000 a year. That's what's (laughs) in my mind. And that's what I needed. And I walked into the office and my boss says to me, he goes, he reads off like, you did everything. You went above and beyond. You won all the awards, you everything. And then he takes his glasses off and he rubs his eyes and he goes, we can only give you 3%. And I remember just heat filling up my body. And I looked at him and I said, 3% of your salary might be something, but 3% of nothing it's nothing because I'm not making anything. That's what I said to him. And I got up just angry and I stood under his door frame. Now, this is a career that I've been working for 10 years. And at this moment, I'd shot Super Bowls. When the celebrities come in, I'm with them. It's a cool job except for the pay. And I'm underneath the door frame and I said, it's over. And I didn't know what that meant. I said, it's over. And my wife, Elizabeth, works at the same newspaper. We're working together. <laughs> And she wants to leave because we're about to have a baby. So I'm responsible. Now adulthood comes in. Yeah. Real life. Which is what keeps so many of us stuck, right? Keeps us stuck. So I have responsibility. Exactly. I can't quit the job. I was fortunate that I got paid so little. Because if I got paid 120 grand, what I did next wouldn't have been possible. I went home. I called my dad. I used to work for my dad on the side, little jobs. And I wanted to work for him. Literally, Teresa, just to pay for diapers and formula. It's the only thing I was thinking. Because we have a baby coming. And he said, no. 
<laughs> so now my dad's rejecting me. It's like the worst <laughs> day like ever. So he, I, I get a 3% raise. I We're laughing that. about it, but then now, it was a big deal. <laughs> it was because I'm laying on our bed. It's midsummer. The heat, the sun's coming through the I'm sweating. I'm so nervous. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm legit. And I'm not often scared. So I'm like, what am I going to do? And he said this to me, and this changed my life. He said, I've been trying to tell you this. You haven't listened. Maybe you're going to listen now. And I was. I'm listening. He goes, you have a skill, but you're not using it correctly. And I said, this what do you mean? This is your dad, right? This my is dad. your dad. Okay. This is my dad. I said, so he's on the other foot. He wasn't, he didn't plan this. He was working mm -hmm. at home. I call him up and he's like, let me give you a little bit of tough love. That's why I love tough love because it really works when it, when it happens. And he goes, you have a skill, but you're not using it correctly. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, i just be honest with you. You've settled. So what do you mean I settled? He said, you've become a really good photographer the last six or seven years. You didn't know anything when you started. You didn't even know what camera to buy but you've worked really hard and now you win this, these huge awards. You're top of the game. And he goes, and you're settling for $32,000 a year in benefits. How do your dad telling you that when you're 32 years old? I'm like, and, and he goes, and he said this, he goes, you can do anything you want. Now you can shoot commercial. You could shoot corporate. You could shoot for magazines on sports. You can teach, you can do anything you want. Your income is unlimited. Potentially you can control your time with your kids as they are born and you're settling. I'll tell you, like a wooden plank across the back of my yeah, head. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a little wake-up call. And I hung up the phone, and I literally picked up the phone book, if you remember phone books, and I called 10 different photographers. I still didn't get it. I want to go work for them. And they knew my name from the news, but can I assist for you? Can I second shoot? They all said no. So I took the phone book, and I threw it against the wall. And I remember people were like, if you can't beat them, you join them. I said, well, if you can't join them, we're going to beat them. So now I got angry and I called Elizabeth and I said, we're starting a business. So I called my eight month pregnant wife to tell her we're going to start a business that we've never done before. Elizabeth's a saint, by the way. A saint. Because this isn't the first time he's told her that we're going to shift no, a little no. bit. No, <laughs> no. She, she's amazing I mean, to deal with me. And she was like, okay. Because we knew we had it because we used to get phone calls at the newspaper looking for photographers for weddings. And we're like, no, we're journalists. We're too good for that. Hang up. The and then all of a sudden I'm like, Duh. And then I started researching for a day and I realized wedding photographers make as much in a day as we made in a month. Well, I was pretty egotistical and arrogant in my own narrow yeah. space. So we started doing weddings and within two months made more in a day than we made in a month. And then we said, oh, okay. Found Dave Ramsey. Let's pay down our debt. Let's build this business up, burn the candle, both ends, doing the full-time job, building a business entrepreneurially for the first time ever and went all in. And it's not an easy story because it was a hard three years. We paid off our house, did everything, quit the job, freedom. And, but here's the rub. I thought we made it and we did. It was great. We had the time, but again, there's levels of entrepreneurship that keep going up and you don't learn until you get to that level. So that, now I'm- Okay, wait, yeah. say that again, because I do think that's true. And even as I work with business owners- some have entrepreneurial mindset, some do not, but at every level, either it's brick and mortar business, entrepreneurial mindset, whatever, there's a shift yep. <laughs> that has That's to take place. And you're not going to get to that shift until you get to that level. Totally. Right? And that's probably, yeah, you and I know it's probably one of the most frustrating parts about coaching is you see something and you can explain it and they can't even see it yet. Mm -mm. And just, just trust me, just follow. So what happened was we built a service-based business. Nothing wrong with a service-based business. But seven, eight years down the line, living a great life. We have three kids, total time freedom, except for when we're shooting. But here's the thing. You're a handyman. You're a photographer. You're anything. You're a singer. One part of your body goes out. Your income goes away, potentially. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I got sciatica in my leg. I couldn't even walk. I can't even move. Now, if I had a full-time job or full-time business moving, I'm in big trouble. I can't even shoot one wedding because my leg is, feels like it's going to explode. And when this went on for three months, I was like, this is, all right, we're a little more risky than I realized. When you're perfectly healthy, everything's fine. When things go wrong, and that's when I started getting into the online space. I started studying, I already studied Dan Miller, but like Seth Godin and people like that. And then realizing, oh, I've built a business for myself.
I built a job for myself. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Robert Kawasaki has the four quadrants yep. and whatever. And in his, he talks a lot about build real estate and do like you've built yourself a job and whatever. And really building something that is intellectual property or in is really the, yeah, the, that's the goal. what the entrepreneurial goes to. And eventually that's another level when you get to there. The beautiful thing is with each level, you don't start over again. No, you get to take your experience with you. That's perfect. Exactly. So what can I, so here's where it changed for me. Shooting weddings, getting bored, shooting this stuff. I'm shooting literally Stanley Cup finals. And I'm, this is my dream job. And I don't even, I can't wait to get home. Yeah. I remember thinking that. And I was like, I've plateaued. I can't do this forever. My mind just doesn't work that way. I need the next challenge. And what happened was I'm shooting a wedding and I'm, and the DJ is struggling. Great DJ, but he's struggling in business. So we sat down over salmon in between this little room before the reception, and I'm coaching him on business. And at the end of it, he goes, oh my God. He goes, you just, you just blew my mind. And then he goes, oh, and he's all, and then he goes out to start the wedding up. And I'm first time, Teresa, in my career, I was like, I don't want to go shoot. I want to talk to him some more. So I come home to my amazing wife and I say, I think I'm done. Now, just think about it. We got a great solid six figure income shooting weddings and commercials and sports. And I don't work that much. And I'm telling her, I think I'm out. And I'll never forget. She goes, what are we going to do? Because we weren't going to do it immediately. So I said to her, that conversation I had with that guy, if I could do that for a living, that would be amazing. So here's where the levels come in. I'm at a spot where all these other people wanted to be at. And I'm like, no, not, I can't do it forever. Got to do something. Got to challenge myself. And what I learned, like you said, you start with experience. Now I get to teach the people yep. that are where I work. it forward. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I, I started doing I pause there though to yeah. talk about what happened because, and I don't have the answer to this, but I want to hear your insight in that there are times when just like what happened to you, right? You have this great conversation with somebody. I have a lot of coaches that listen to this podcast, a lot of helping professional people that yep. listen in and you had one conversation where you felt this, oh, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I, I hear people say, people always come to me for advice or they always ask me, so this is the business I should build. I think there's a yes to that, but I also think you have to have the entrepreneurial mindset mm -hmm. to go with it just because you're the one that people always ask for advice or want to know your input or want you to mentor them or sit with them in a faith space or whatever, doesn't mean you have the, you need both. If you're oh. going to be in this business, you need both. It's, so what's your thoughts on that? It's, it's, it's art and business at the same time. It's okay. so for instance, in my space, people are great at the art and they're terrible at the business. Any type of creative space, right? I was the same well way. Said. I was a, a, became a great photographer. Knew nothing about business. Knew nothing about entrepreneurship. So instead of studying photography more, which I was, you always want to get better, but I'm in the upper level now. I was a beginner in business. So guess where I went? I went to Barnes & Noble because I didn't have any money. And I read business books and I studied. So when even when it came to this, Teresa, when it came to that conversation of that, this is what I want to do. And I can't say I want to do this for the rest of my life. I never say that. Because I know my mind in five years, I'll want to do something completely different to know the way that it worked. But I, from that moment on, I didn't say, okay, I'm going to put an ad out and I'm going to hope people come to me. No, I start completely from scratch. As an entrepreneur, if I'm going to be in the coaching space, I'm a beginner now again. So I go right back into the dirt and I'm reading and I'm studying and I'm having conversations and I'm doing everything I need to do to understand this space. And I think that's, you hear us talk about membership freedom, about market research. Any new thing that I'm doing, I want to have at least 50 conversations with people in that space to understand, find all the pain points, find the objections, find the wording. Like to me, that's the entrepreneurial stuff of you've got to be able to get into the dirt and get your fingers dirty and not just wait for a client to come to you. Oh, nobody's hiring me. Are you doing anything? Are you making an offer? I say that to people all the time of, if you've decided you're going to give your business, I hate to call it a side hustle. That's one of mm -hmm. my, you either have, you're either doing a part-time business or full-time business. Yeah. 
hustle sounds hard and I don't like things that sound like I don't want to hustle around it. But if you've set aside so many hours you're going to give to this thing you're building yep. that you really do want to do, if you're not with clients, you should be doing something else around that business. Don't just say, I don't have any clients. I set aside 15 hours or 20 hours a week to this, but because I'm not really making any money, I'm not doing anything. No, you commit that 20 hours is... 20 hours you're giving to conversation, research, reading, knowing all you can to grow yourself in that space. Totally. One of the phrases I hate that I think I go against pop, popular culture on is I hate the phrase, oh, just charge what you're worth. You're not worth anything. You're not worth anything. I love that. You're not, you you're, might think you are. So but you're not yet. It's not proven. Patrick You've got to get the experience. Yeah. Patrick Mahomes wasn't getting paid to fling footballs at 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Writers don't get paid to write their first article. It is interesting that in kind of this build your business entrepreneurial space, we think and we compare ourselves that if so-and-so is getting this much for coaching or this much for whatever, then that must be what I can charge. And we do. It's just like an in indie industry. You were making 32000 as yeah. a beginning photographer, you weren't making 132,000. No, and I wasn't and a beginning photographer. That's a, we, that's a poor, bad example have, because it's a, it's a job, but yeah. Yeah, but we have to pay our dues, so to speak, and work our way to that. And I think many times in this space, we do see these people that are big names in the industry because every industry has their big names, yep. even ours. Yep. And we think they got their... They just popped up on the scene. So the, the most story, of them paid their dues for they, years, but they don't tell it enough. No, they don't. And you and I have talked about that, even with people that we know that oh, totally. don't tell their backstory enough of the steps along the way and the levels of entrepreneurship that happen and the mindset shifts that happen at every, and the things you have to overcome in your yeah. mindset at every level. The story I give all the time when I was in the, when I started this space and I'm trying to really consume content in the online space and Tony Robbins, then he's big now, he's huge now, but he was, he was all over the place then maybe 2014. Yeah. And he tells a story about, he was, he was broke and then he was going to, so he was, he was raised, they had no money when he was a kid. Yeah. So now his wife gets pregnant. They're going to have the first kid. He's making $38,000 a year. So it attached to me because I was very similar. And he said, I swore to myself, I will not be have a kid and be broke. And then he says this. So the next year I made a million dollars. And then he goes on with the story and I'm like, what, 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 hold on. What happened between? <laughs> yeah. Nobody cares about it. I, everybody cares, but it's such fluff from a million and beyond. Doesn't matter because now your network's bigger. They're referring people to you. You're getting affiliates. You could pay yeah. for ads. It's a completely different world, but from 38 to a million, that what happened. And he didn't talk about it. And mm -hmm. I'm like, this is what we need to talk about. So I love helping people get from 38 to a million. Me too. I think that's where you and I are so similar is I want to be honest, to be transparent, to be real with people. It doesn't happen overnight. It's hard work. But I think the drive of an entrepreneurial mindset yep. keeps you going, keeps you pivoting, keeps you doing all the things. So our story is probably crossed about 2019, something like that. For the first time, somewhere in there, 18, 19. Yep. I think the first place I ever met you in person was at Social Media Marketing World. Is, oh, wasn't uh, it Dan's? It was at Social Media Marketing? Might have been because then you joined Dan Miller's Mastermind about a year before I did. Okay. And, and I think that might have been our first in-person meeting. And then I joined right after that in 2018, 2019, somewhere in there. Yep. It feels like a long time ago, which it I know, really isn't, a, but it feels like a long time ago. And I remember even you pivoting again, even while we were in the mastermind together, you made a pretty big pivot, I think to teaching photographers and you were doing how to build businesses. You were doing some of that. Yep. And then just recently, so this is where I want to get to, because yeah. I want listeners to hear just this idea that you do and that you help people do now. Recently, you just pivoted again. Yeah. And really, I don't know that it's so much a pivot as it is a niching a down. Niche down. Yeah. So talk to me about that, how that came about, what you're doing now that I think fits so much of your skill set and who you are. But tell us what you're doing now. Yeah, just real quick backstory. When I 
going through this period that we talked about, I wound up creating a course with a guy about sports photography. And we, mm-hmm. and, and the thing, Kyle Schultz, and, and the thing was, it was about my past history. Like you said, we didn't start from the beginning, but now I connect with somebody, connection, where now we release a course that makes as much in a day as I used to make in a year as a photographer, same skill set. So now I'm like, this world is really interesting. So now I start coaching. And then I started my first mastermind around the idea of freelance to freedom, which is our book. And that went on and it was named Total Life Freedom for about five or six years. So that's what I did. But within that, over all that time, online income, time freedom, location freedom was a huge part of just the message. It wasn't about get as rich as possible. It was about live the life that you really want. Right? That's so what let me the- pause right there because yeah. this is why I wanted Vincent on the podcast because this podcast is all about talking to people that are doing what matters and living from rest, not rush. Mm-hmm, so Vincent by. is, all, yeah, he signed me up right before we started recording. Is like, oh, I was just with my kid at the junkyard doing whatever. <laughs> like Vincent is such a hands-on dad, such a, so present. I was listening to an episode you did on your podcast you used to have. And you talk about, I spent three days laying in my floaty in my pool, like just thinking, discerning actually this next pivot that you're going to talk yeah. about. And it's why I really do admire you. I love what you've done because you and Elizabeth have created the life that you want to have. You Thank live you. from a place of rest, not mm-hmm. rush. You're a hustler. I will give you that. You get it done, but not in a place of urgency. And I get it. You live in the lifestyle that you choose to live in. And I give you kudos and respect Thanks. for that. I, I really appreciate that. That means a lot. I did a social media post a couple of weeks ago. I was like, people are like, what do you do? How do you spend your time? I spend 50% of my time just thinking and daydreaming. Uh-huh. 50%. 30% of the time having conversations and essentially 20% creating content around that daydreaming and those conversations. That's really it. So I'm probably one of the only people who go, how are you doing? I, I do not say busy. I am not busy. Oh, I hate when people say busy. Everybody they says look it. at me and say, you're so busy. And you I'm like, so busy. No, no, I'm not. No. I'm, you see my life, which is very rich and full, but it's not busy. busy. I want more people to say that because it's just like that, but you don't think that. So that's what happened. So we have this membership that's going really well. So I'm in the membership today, five, six years, but I had this unrest where most people might be like, it's good enough. Just keep riding it out. Just scale it. I'm like, but we know as entrepreneurs that never works. If you no. don't continue to pivot, you die and you die on the vine and you, the world is pivoting. So you've That's, got to be thinking of the next, the next thing. thing. And it, it, it is a hard balance of the person that just keeps doing new things and never locks in. No, I always believe in get to a place, lock it in, get that lifestyle you want, get the life you want. And then from there, always be thinking, because you were there five or six years. It's not mm-hmm. like you pivoted every no. year for, yeah, you hung no. out for a while. My, the way my framework is be content, but not satisfied. I'm yeah. content. I don't need anything else. I'm happy. But if I stay there for more than two weeks, I'm a wreck. Yeah. I'm just bored. I'm like stagnant. So what happened was I'm sitting here in this membership about a year ago. And I'm like, what exactly are we doing here to myself? So that's when I was like, I go into this cocoon phase. And that's what I did. I went out in the pool and I looked like a bum. I'm just laying on a pool float with a drink, just sitting there for three or four hours a day, just thinking. And I'm like, what is this? What is, and my wife looks at me like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm just thinking. And she knows, okay, he's thinking. And finally it, would, it just hit me and it's not sexy or glamorous. I was like, it's memberships. And I'm like, why did I just say that? Like it's member because we just picked up a move from Pennsylvania to Florida where, the, where we wanted to live just like that. I'm like, how are we able to do that? We had online remote recurring revenue. We couldn't have done that with the wedding business. I couldn't have done it with all these other things. We kept leveling up to where we want. Not, we didn't know why. We just know we wanted more freedom. And once we got that freedom, I'm like, spend the time at the junkyard with my son, building, getting tires for his go-kart, going for a sunrise to sunset trip, going to a bit. I want, my dad wasn't around when I was a kid because his business got destroyed at 15 years old. I didn't see him. And that is a value for me to, I'm not going to have that happen. My dad, he didn't do it on purpose. He got destroyed and it destroyed our, my youth. So I'm like, I'm not missed. So my business for personally is for me to be with my family. Mm -hmm. Now, the more, yes, the more I optimize that, the I want to not have to do anything, but still do it. I don't want any pressure. You need to be, that's why I don't have a schedule. I don't use a Calendly link. 
My business requires four to five hours a week. Everything else is bonus for me. Yeah, to if do. I want to talk to Vincent, I have to do it in weird and strange ways because <laughs> Just there's text no me. calendar link. To there's no calendar Vincent. link. Because here's what happens. It happened yesterday. Hey, you want to get on a call? How about next Thursday at three? I'm like, no, I'm open right now. I'm like, oh yeah, so am I. I'm like, isn't that funny? We're all open, but we keep scheduling for the future. I'm like, just pick up the phone. So what happened was I sat down. I said, memberships. Member, and, and, and I'm like, wait a second. We have a call every month within our membership, helping people with memberships. We already have people having success with this. Why don't we create an adjacent community that is niched down just towards memberships? And we dive deep into that. And that's when the market research started happening. I talked to you during that time and had all the conversations, found out all the hurdles or all the objections, the price point. And when we launched Amazing and now it's rolling. So I just think it's to, to your point, to your audience, coaches, consultants, people that are have a business that they run, but it requires their time. A lot of service-based business owners, they don't realize until they hit the ceiling of, oh crap, I don't have any more time. And now I got to take this information, this knowledge, these connections and create more recurring revenue that doesn't require me to be there, but I'm still adding value. That was the pivot. That was that final. That was the, I won't say final. That was the last pivot. I don't know what the next pivot is. Yeah. It's going to happen. And I will say this because you talk and we joke about, you don't have a calendar, you don't have a schedule, all of that. You don't, but yet with the business that you do, you are very purposeful. There very. is a call every week. Mm -hmm. There is, it's not at the same time every week oh, on, purpose. Um, on purpose, but there is a call every week. You are very purposeful. I know you and Elizabeth both are in, in how you structure and run your, but not it's freedom, but yet where you're going, you have a roadmap, you have oh. a way that you run your business. So sometimes when I talk to Vince and I feel like, oh, he's just doing all over the place and he doesn't oh. know what he's doing next. And that is not true. Oh. I don't want people to hear that you are not very purposeful in how you run Thank your you. business. I think purposeful and regimented are two completely different they things. They are. And I just want people to hear that I'm you can have a personality like Vincent's. Yeah. And do and this. Because we talk a lot about personality here. You can have a personality like Vincent's and still be very purposeful in how you run. And I know Elizabeth helps you a lot with that. She does oh. a lot of the back end stuff and they work Even. together and all of that, but he is not like all over the place, scattered, whatever. It's oh, very it, focused. We've all heard the big rocks theory, right? You have the, the container, you put the yep. big rocks I in. I teach person. it all the time. Yep. That's us. We're, we're very much, we know what matters mm -hmm. and, and the relationships matter. Meaning if Teresa needs to talk to me, I'm going to get on the phone with her. Even yep. though it's not part of the package or it's not a, but I also have my boundaries. I'm a New York Italian. I'm, I'm a really hard person to take advantage of. <laughs> yeah. Because I'll be like, no. And I'll yeah. tell you why, no, if you push the boundaries too. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and be like, I wish I would have said something. No, sometimes I'll probably say it too soon, but I will not be, but I, th th that does not mess with me at all. Most important things go in first, which is the community and the relationships and even the content within the group. Meaning those calls, those weekly calls, I do three you to four hours. You are there. Hours. You're very present. You're... All it's in. researched. It's I spend time on it before, but if I can crush it for that one call, it gives me freedom for the rest of my week. Yep. That's why it's let's go point. there. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about memberships. Yeah. How they work. Cause when we say that word membership, people have all kinds of definitions of what that means. And I even remember when you called me and go, Hey, do you have membership? And I'm like, yeah, I guess I do. We actually have two mm -hmm. within our business. We have a low end $20 a month membership yep. in our One Life Maps tool that we use. And that has all kinds of little perks and benefits around it for $20. We have the monthly calls. We do all this stuff. Then we have what I would call more of a high-end membership, mm -hmm. which is our coaches that have been certified, have a network community that they're a part of. And that's $350 a month. Mm -hmm. Actually, we have a couple of levels to that, but it's more of a high-end membership. So even mm -hmm. when you and I were talking, and I want to say that to people, some memberships are these low end and we've got lots of people in them. Mm -hmm. So how do you define, and some are higher end and maybe have less people. What to you are the things that make a membership? Great question. The, what you just described is the variety within it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why people say, which one should I do? It's like saying, which kid's your favorite? 
It's a really hard Who's question. your audience? Who's your people? What do they want? And have you, talk, have you talked to them? Do you even know? We know people that launch these things and they have a lot of followers and they get two people to sign up. They didn't talk to their people. They didn't find out what would they be, what do they think the price point would be? It's a very easy thing. Let's, for instance, let's say Teresa is going to launch a membership and she's, I'm going to talk to 50 people within the target audience, real conversations, right? And Teresa goes, how much do you think this would be worth? Just give me your honest opinion because I'm not looking to sell you one. I'm just, I'm looking for information. They go, and then you get all these people that say, I, I think it's worth $100. I think it's worth $75. I think it's worth $150. Guess what? When Teresa launches for $59 for founding members, it's going to sell out because she already knows that there's the audience there for it. And she knows that the price point can be higher. That's tremendous market research that you can start with a following. As Seth Godin says, you don't want to start with crickets and then you learn from there. So then you can keep adding on and adding on to it. So it is, it's a hard question to answer because you have a Liz Wilcox who has $9 membership and 4,500 members. You've got people that have thousand dollar memberships and there's different price points that Wayne Previtt, who's in our group, he's got a thousand dollars. It's a thousand dollars a year. So it's a lower price, but there's, there's hundreds and hundreds, there may be a thousand people at this point. There's so many different price points. That's why we talk about the stadium model, right? I was a sports photographer for years and I realized, holy crap, like sports has the greatest business model that nobody's talking about. And, and, and it's a membership model. If you think about it, it's one game. It's very niche down which we can talk about very niche down. Even every position is niche down. Third base is way different than catcher, which is different than pitcher, right? They give tons of content away for free. Like we talked about earlier, you can listen to the Cardinals game on the radio this afternoon or watch on TV for a little bit of money. But if you want to get into the stadium, cheap seats, luxury box seats and everything in between, and they have a concourse for all their products. It sounds similar to a lot of coaches that can build out multiple income streams around one idea. And your coaching, as you do this, becomes more expensive because your coaching gets closer to the field. It's, and, and what you pay in a stadium, and let me know if I'm rambling. I just get excited about this topic. I know. I'm just letting you talk because I want everybody to hear the full thing. What you pay for when you go to a stadium is only one thing. It's the same exact game. You're only paying for access. $9 to sit up here, $500 to sit down here. You might catch a baseball, get an autograph, just get better sight lines. Same thing with us. With every level that we have different content, but primarily what you're paying for is access to me or our network because yep. that blows everything up. When you can realize it that way, instead of charging a little amount of money for coaching, you could be like, oh, maybe not at the moment, but my coaching could be a lot more money if I had a $20 thing here like Teresa and a $50 thing and a $250 thing. But me personally, this is where prices start. Immediately, if you set those things up, there are people, there are thousands of people that'll pay 30 bucks. There are hundreds of people that'll pay 300. There's a few people that'll pay 3000. And I think Vincent, the thing that I, I get from this model and I've been using it for a while as well in some way, shape or form is that for many of you might be listening that are in the one-to-one -one coaching space, you will run out of time. Yes. Yes. You, you are putting a lid on your business. So you have to find a way and you just don't have the energy. You think, oh, I got eight hours a day, five days a week. I could coach 40 people. You can't. <laughs> it's not scalable. It's not mentally capable. All of you things. Out. And there are people that want access to you. They want to test your content. They want to hear from you. They want to do things, but they're not ready for that full on one-to-one -one conversation yep. yet. So- for me, I know giving access to our tools and to content in different ways, even the book was one of them. That's yep. that introductory, as Vincent would say, he has a couple of those as well. And there are lots of tools that you can use in your membership and ways you can drive people to it. But your time is of greatest value. Yep. <laughs> so to be on the field and get an autograph, as you say, is more of an investment and you will find those people that want to invest in that. And there's lots of people that want to sit in the cheap seats in the bleachers and be a part, but they don't ever care to be on the field. And they can't pay for it or they don't want to pay for it. And they don't have the time to do it. And, and so it, I say it all the time in terms of fractional income. That was the savior for us. Meaning when we did weddings, every wedding mattered. Any cancellation mattered, right? That's $4,000 off the books. 
Then you go to coaching, the same exact thing. Somebody, you're used to this amount of income coming in. You have, say, 10 clients. You lose one client, that could be 10, 15% yeah. of your income. That hurts. So I wanted to get out of that. How do I get out of that pain? How do I get out of that up and down? When you think about it, what if you have hundreds of people mm -hmm. paying multiple levels of pricing? It, it gets to the point where if somebody leaves, it's more of an ego hit than anything. Like, oh, why isn't it good enough? Oh, bummer. It doesn't affect you the same way. Like, I come from a world where at 16 or 15 years old, my dad and his business partner emptied the bank accounts overnight and left town. My dad went from a thriving business to, to broke and being sued and almost losing our house overnight. So I have a little bit more of a pain point. Of, I want to be a little more protected than that. Yeah. And some people might not worry about that because they never experienced it. I saw it. I came from, I went to school watching my dad, who was ambitious, laying on the couch face down. Yeah. I came home from school when he was there. Yeah. I'm like, it didn't hit me right away. But as I started having kids, I'm like, I can't let that yeah. happen. Yeah. Our stories matter. Our stories form those things. And that's your story. So you're like, I'm building something in a different way. And yeah. that's why I do believe in some type of membership too. Here's what's interesting. Even a if you're listening and you have a brick and mortar but you're a service industry, yep. you can still have a membership. That's so I work with an industry that I encourage all of them. I coach with several women that are in a certain industry that I encourage all of them to have a membership. It's their high end. People are basically paying ahead, <laughs> putting it in their bank, in their wallet. It's their style of membership, but that gives them that income every month so that if, it's a seasonal and there are things. So I just want you to think outside the box, no matter what kind of business you're in, a membership. If you're a personal trainer, you can have an online membership. If you're a, whatever you do, a, any type of industry, I believe can have some form of membership that creates that revenue. Just look around, just look at the different stores or the target. Now they're all instituting it. We used to buy Photoshop as a product. Now we can't. Nope. $29 a month. But I think you hit on something that's really huge for going forward. The service-based business owner with membership. Yes. So we have a guy in our neighborhood. He is a auto mechanic and he had his own shop overhead employees. So he moved here to Lakewood Ranch. And so he has a mobile mechanic shop. And we talk to him all the time. My son is literally out there now changing our brakes. He's 16 years old and he works with him. And so he only stays in our neighborhood. And, but what happened was word of mouth blew up so fast that he's working seven to nine. Yeah. He has so much work and we keep talking to him about this. And we had a cop two days ago. It's like, Nick, if you had a membership model where, Hey, I can pay to be a gold member, meaning top priority, yeah. maybe oil changes. You just have it in your schedule. I don't have to schedule it. You're saving me time. Now you're going to get membership fees from all these different people and membership prices. Meaning, Hey, if you're in the membership, these are what the thing, if you're not, here's what it is. That's exactly what I have coached some of these businesses that I work with too, of that is money that's in your wallet, in your bank. And, and you get to treat those people. You said the gold level. So yeah. you give them quarterly gifts, you do different things for them. They are your top priority and yep. they know that. And so there are. I just want to say that there's, we're talking a lot about online memberships for online businesses and things, but there are memberships too for brick and mortar service-based businesses that are a whole nother thing that people, there's another niche down, Vincent, let's it, just it, be honest. Well, honestly, we're writing the course of service-based subscription. We're writing this because this is so needed. Jody Mayberry in our group just posted the other day. He met, we had a phone call and he's I thought about you. I went on Alaska Airlines because he flies Alaska all the time. And he's, they now have an Alaska Access membership. And yeah. I'm like, what's that? $5 a month. And you get to know what the new deals are coming up before anybody else for tickets. And you get a voucher every month for free internet on a plane, which is $8. Yeah. So they eliminate friction, join the membership, and you're basically going to get free internet. You don't, I don't have to sell you on the plane anymore. You are now a recurring revenue member that feels more valued and gets more value than me always selling you and feeling like I'm pitching you an $8 internet service. We can all be doing some aspect. It doesn't have to be your main income. No. And it should be built on something that you have niche to. So you know what I'm saying? It shouldn't yeah. be like, oh, I'm just going to go find some type of membership to build. You no. need to be passionate about 
what you're building the membership. That's around. that's the idea of a stadium. If you try to buy build six different stadiums all over Illinois, these little you're running around like crazy. Nobody's coming to them. Choose your niche, define it, commit to it, and then build your levels around. It. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, friend, you know us. We could go on forever because we love this stuff. And Vincent is one of the most passionate people about helping you. Uh, I. If you're looking at membership models, I cannot highly recommend enough. I'm part of his community. Uh, and one of the things I want to wrap up with is actually a vent that he has coming up. It's a while out. It's next January. But we are going to have access in the show notes to a link where if you want to come to this conference, I'm going to have him explain a little bit about it. I'll be there. Would love to meet you. If you're listening, we've never met in person. Vince and I can't wait to meet you. But he's going to have this conference. Again, outside the box, so different. And within the show notes will be a link to the application. Yes, you heard me, application to come to the conference. So Vincent, wrap us up with this next conference that you're doing in January of 2025. Yeah. So I'm a Seinfeld fan and, and my favorite episode is the opposite, which is do everything the opposite. So I was like, I love conferences, but I hate conferences. Like I love them because that's where we meet, right? You and I met there. We met, yeah, in the we met at a conference. Through- we met, but we didn't meet listening to a speaker. We met in the hallways talking. So I would go and spend $1,500 for a ticket to social media marketing world and not go to one planned thing. I would stay in the hallways and meet people. A right? lot of us is because we can't sit still during the whole thing. That's exactly part. That's a big part of it. <laughs> so I, I said, I was like, what if we created an unconference? What if we, what if we took the best aspects of the hallways of a conference and merged them with an intimate mastermind? type of retreat. So that like, all right. And I think people thought it would take me like six months. I'm like, no, we got the venue, the NBC Suites in Sarasota, Florida, February 3rd through the 5th of next year. And we, and like you said, two things, we are limiting the number of people. So it's un- a limit of a hundred people because I think as they grow, the, that's the thing about conferences, the bigger they get, the less connected you are, right? Absolutely. So if you can make it intimate, you can make it exclusive. And exclusive doesn't mean like you have to be a billionaire. It's not about that. It's are you a generous, helpful entrepreneur that's looking to grow and connect, right? So 100 people and it's application only because I don't want my brother-in-law or somebody like that doesn't fit in to come to the... When you have a conference that anybody could buy a ticket, you could be with anybody. So our job is to vet, to have conversations with the people, make sure they're the right fit. It's excuse for you to get on the phone with more people. Have, you uh, do that. I love it. I have, a call right, I have a call right at this with somebody that applied for it. Yeah. And I get to say, oh, yeah, I get to ask the right questions. Because if you're going to come to the event, Teresa, I want to make sure that you're around like-minded people that see what we see. And you can, and that's where the magic happens. Yeah, That's the unconference. And uh, and he used his membership first. Yes. So just hear that. Because he had a membership that people are already connected to, he could offer it to them first. That's where I got to take advantage of it. Members- and then it just went public. And by application just recently. So you get to be one of the first to uh, come in. But if this helps your people just real quick, members first, that's the focus. When you see it that way, members, they are your top priority. Like we talked about earlier. So what you guys got was the best price that nobody else is going to get and first access to buy tickets. So we put a certain amount of tickets up for early bird and they sold out within the membership. As Seth Godin would say, begin with the following before it even goes public. It's a success. And now I get to say, Okay, who is going to compliment? Who else? Yeah. 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 So thank you. Thank you. Super excited. It'll be a link in the show notes. Check it out. And hey, if you apply, you get to have a conversation one to one with Vincent. So that's a win in my book right there as he looks at your application. Hey, friend, always a pleasure. Always so good. Love that you're in my life and in my circle. And I thank you so much for thank just spending some time with me on the podcast. Let me just praise you for a moment. The way you do business, the way that you connect, I'm honored and grateful to be a part of it. You, you do this wonderfully. And I just want to give you all the kudos in the world because when I talk to people and I hear your name and everybody praises you and is thrilled to be connected with you, it you makes just, me just... just just honored to be a part of it. So thank you. Oh, thank you, friend. Kudos. And uh, yeah, make sure you apply. I'm telling you, because then we can hang out together, which is what Vincent and I like to do. As in, in, in Sarasota in February in the sunshine, the is not a bad gig. Not I'm just a bad gig. Say. That's right. <laughs> so, exactly. Thank you, friend. Thanks, Teresa. That, my friends, was my friend Vincent. How much fun. So many great nuggets in this episode as a business owner as someone who builds memberships in the mindset piece, just so many amazing things. 
it was so much fun. Remember, friends, that these are the extraordinary moments. When you get to have a great conversation with a great friend, just cherish it like I cherish this conversation with Vincent. Remember that every ordinary day has an extraordinary moment. Moments like these, you just have to look for them. I'll be back next week with more from the Doing What Matters podcast. Talk to you soon.